Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Arndt. Uh, I am a nurse staff member, a part of the Data Science Engagement Group here. Uh, welcome to the Department of Energy Cross Facilities Workflows Training. Uh, I have a, a short introduction. I'm going to go through logistics, and then I am going to pass off the reins to our first speaker. So uh, I want to get the mindset right for everyone to, to start things off. What's the value of thinking about computing in terms of a workflow? Uh, start by imagining yourself as a researcher with one simulation to run. You log in, set up the input, put in the, in the queue, and after some watching and waiting, your results are ready. It was simple and easy. Next, uh, add some ambition. There's a supercomputer allocation. So use a loop to run a thousand variations of the same simulation. Suddenly, many unnoticed steps that happen in the first case become visible and challenging. All 1,000 simulation initializations need to be prepared on the system with uh, additional organization that you didn't need in the first case. The submission script needs to understand how to step through all those 1,000 different inputs and not get them mixed up or duplicate work. If there's a small chance your simulation can crash and need to be restarted, suddenly the monitoring of that gets uh, a lot more difficult and complex. Where and how the simulation outputs are written also needs organization, and that structure has to be able to feed into whatever your downstream analysis is. The workflow is all steps start to finish, and especially including all of those less visible ones needed to do your science. When your, your mental model includes the entire workflow, that makes it much easier to apply automation. Successfully automating parts of or your entire workflow leads to tremendous benefits. Less effort can scale much larger, faster, and be much more reliable than being a, hand, a human at a terminal typing in each command one by one. It's the difference between running run one analysis on your laptop and all of the analysis you need to do on a supercomputer. Workflow management tools are the means of that automation. There are more than 300 out there, spans all science domains and computing models. It is reasonable to not know where to start or what to look for, how to evaluate them, and, and choose for yourself. Uh, we, we, there's, you know, eight, 10 of us, and we don't have the time to look through every single tool and every single characteristic either. Uh, we're making the best thing we find for a use case and move forward. Today, we're going to show you four workflow management tools, which provide a wide range of useful solutions for HPC systems. We hope that this will give you a solid foundation, not only for solving workflow problems you have today, but for evaluating other tools, tools that may not even exist yet, and choosing the right ones to meet the needs of your research. Okay. Next, the agenda for the day. Uh, as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to pass off to Katan, who's going to introduce GNU Parallel as the first tool. Uh, there will be five minute breaks between each presentation after that. Uh, Bjorn and Tyler will present Parcel. Uh, we'll have lunch at the best time for lunch we could find on a four time zone or more event. The fireworks tutorial and exercises presented by Lauren and Sean will be at 11 a.m. Pacific time. And the fourth and final presentation for the day will be Balsam. Uh, which will be presented by Andrew, Christine, and Nick. Uh, here is some of the information about sort of communications and logistics. Uh, first off, there is a GitHub repository link with uh, a large number of examples and details for each of these tools. Uh, they should be in working order to run on the various systems that we have access to at each of our facilities. 
uh, you should just be able to get clone those into your storage and, and start going through them. There is a living Google Doc movement available for questions and responses. Uh, there is a workflows community Slack channel that will also be live communication for uh, questions or support or whatever else may need to be done. Uh, the workflow tool decider is a utility written by Andrew that may help uh, offer some guidance if you're looking for a workflow management tool to use. A uh, benefit there is that it features more tools than we can just cover during this time. And we've also got a link to an exit survey, which I'm going to put up front because, of course, not everyone is going to spend uh, all of their time with us here. So, uh, you know, even if you're only around for one or two sessions, please grab the exit survey link and all feedback is appreciated. Uh, we have some system reservations available at NERSC and ALCF. Uh, these are the details for those reservations and using them. Uh, to use Perlmutter or Cori, you just need to export those environment variables and your Slurm job submissions will use that reservation. And this is the information for using the reservation on Polaris. Uh, and all of these things, the, the links, like I understand that you can't directly click or copy something off of a screen share. Those should be available in emails sent out, in Slack, in other information sources that you can cut and paste out of. Uh, finally, uh, I want to mention acknowledgments for the large number of staff and individuals that have helped us set up this entire presentation. Uh, okay, Haritha, Beth, and Madeline for administration support. Or Joshi and Daniel, uh, training infrastructure support. They helped us set up some of the databases that are necessary. Uh, Adam Nav a uh, fireworks developer helped us with the fireworks presentation. Uh, Logan, Kyle, and you do uh, parcel support in that section. Uh, Murat, Chris, and Neil uh, helped us with lamp support, which is a part of the balsam demo, we'll, which will be the final presentation of the day. And Yasemin, Raphael, and Helen, uh, for helping us with sort of the setup and structure of running a large scale training like this. As most of us, this is the first time that we've uh, taken this deep uh, role in, in doing a big endeavor like this. All right, and with that, I have cleared up the introduction. I am going to pass over the reins to Katan, who will get us started with GNU Parallel. Hey, thanks, Bill. Um, can I get my check here real quick, uh, please? Thank you. Um, I'll start with uh, sharing my screen. <clears throat> Uh, uh, Laurie, could you please enable me to share my screen? It seems like I'm not able to share my screen at this time. Uh, okay, let me try. You want to try again? Yes, uh, it seems like I can now. Oh, uh, it got disabled one more time. I think Nick and I toggled it at the same time. Try again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm able to now. All right, can I get a screen test check, please? Can everyone see my screen? Looks good. Awesome, thank you. 
Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ketan Maheshwari. Uh, I am uh, with uh, NCCS division at uh, ORNL. And I'm going to start uh, this uh, training uh, with the first session uh, where I'm going to talk about uh, where uh, myself and my, my colleague Bill will talk about GNU Parallel. Um, I will cover the first part where I will uh, give a, I will cover uh, general information about uh, GNU Parallel, like, you know, features, options available, what it does, and, you know, it's working mechanisms. And uh, in the second part, Bill will cover uh, how to, you know, run practical examples on clusters and supercomputers uh, using Parallel. So, you know, so this slide basically gives an overview of what's uh, gonna come in the in the in the upcoming slides. <clears throat> um, so I'll I'll start right away with um, uh, a generic in introduction to you know what what GNU Parallel is. So um, um, I'm sure many of you uh, have heard about this tool. It's a um, it's an open source tool available, uh, you know, generally available to, to, to use where uh, it can parallelize uh, shell commands, right? And it runs right from your shell and, um, you know, you provide commands and it will run them in parallel. It is um, um, a highly configurable tool. You know, there are so many uh, configurations that can be done. It's quite flexible. And I also find that it is easy to install. In fact, um, um, I find that it has been designed to be easily installed in that it is kind of, you know, encapsulated in a single Perl as a single Perl program. Although everything is under the hood, you only get, you know, one parallel uh, tool without any uh, without too many dependencies, right? So generally installable and available. <clears throat> it is very well suited to, to run, you know, single core uh, tasks on, you know, fat compute nodes to leverage multi-core architectures. You know, it will, uh, you know, let you run processes in parallel on multiple cores that are available. It's also well suited to, you know, to environments where you have bag of workstations available, like, you know, test, test beds, where you, you may want to, you know, benchmark uh, a, a distributed system, or you want to run something in parallel over a, over a, a set of nodes. <clears throat> it's a mature tool, uh, very, you know, actively being developed with frequent releases over the last 20 years. Um, um, you know, I feel like it's a, it's a, it's a very powerful tool for, for the simplicity as you will see that it offers um, uh, in its uh, usage. So let's dive into its uh, 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 common syntax and semantics on how to use this tool parallel. Um, so so it, um, uh, typically there are three uh, common forms in which you can invoke GNU Parallel. Uh, the first one uh, and the most common one is where you would uh, provide uh, a command uh, and a triple colon syntax, which is kind of, you know, peculiar to this one uh, and, uh, and uh, followed by arguments lists. So, you know, so that the command will run in parallel for each of the input arguments. A similar but slightly different uh, syntax would be where you want to put your arguments in an input file and ask parallel to read uh, arguments one by one. Then you would put uh, four quad columns, so four, co four columns after your command, uh, followed by the, the, the input file, which has you know lines of arguments and parallel will pick those arguments and it will run the command for for in parallel for those arguments. Um, there is an alternative in place of if if you if you don't want to use uh, four 
colons, uh, dash a flag could be used as an alternative syntax. Um, and then the, the, the third common form to invoke it is uh, via, via pipeline, right? So if you provide um, uh, a command, its output could be passed into pipe and could be piped into parallel and parallel will run the, the command for you know, each of the lines in the standard output as one parameter or one argument. Uh, also uh, uh, worth noting is that uh, the, the triple and quad colon separators, although very common, they could be you know, modified with the arg set uh, flag if needed or preferred. Uh, so let's start with some of the examples here. So for example, you know, if you wanna, for example, run echo command for a bunch of arguments, then you know it would simply you you would simply put echo triple colon and uh, followed by these are uh, the the list of list of arguments. It also accepts wildcards as uh, you know uh, on a, on a terminal. So if you wanna, for example, count lines on all the text files. In, the, in a given place, in a given directory, you could do that. Same way, quad colon, quad colon syntax works as expected. Uh, one, uh, one thing to be careful about the dash A flag is that the, the parameter file would uh, appear before the command, which is kind of counterintuitive here, but that's a little bit of a peculiarity with the you know, parallel. A uh, few more examples. Uh, uh, one that I found very valuable is when uh, when I want to run something, you know, in a nested parallel loop, right? So typically, what we would do if we want to run it sequentially, it would be a nested for loop, for, as shown in this example. But uh, simply putting those arg lists in a in a one liner separated by the triple colons will enable you to get the same effect as, as if you are running a nested for loop uh, and that too in parallel as opposed to a bash loop, which would obviously run sequentially. Um, then when we have multiple such arguments separated by triple colons, uh, GNU parallel pro provides uh, uh, sort of a, you know, a rich mechanism to, you know, how to, uh, where to place those arguments in the command, right? So for example, with curly braces, wherever you want to put the arguments, uh, you would provide the curly braces and at runtime, it, they would be replaced by the actual arguments. Um, within curly braces, you can provide numbers and that would be replaced by the numbered section in the argument section. Um, and in addition to that, uh, parallel provides several other patterns that you could put in the curly braces uh, to treat the arguments in special ways. Um, at the man page for parallel has more information <clears throat> about all those possibilities. You know, for example, you just want to treat file without extension, or you just want to treat a directory and, and such. Then those can be selected using uh, using special patterns put in the curly braces. So speaking of man page, uh, there are several uh, places where uh, rich uh, documentation and helping resources are available. Um, man pages would be, you know, uh, uh, most obvious. They are available right there on the terminal. Uh, man parallel is a more comprehensive, gives more comprehensive information about the tool, but there is a parallel tutorial as well. There is a quick help available as well with the dash dash help flag. Um, the author of Parallel has uh, several YouTube uh, tutorials that are available on this link. The next link is uh, the home page for the tool. Uh, and then there is a, you know, quite rich discussion available on, for example, Hacker News uh, uh, for GNU Parallel. And finally, there is also, you know, there are often, uh, you know, we find that there are several alternatives available 
compared to that are comparative to group uh, parallel, uh, especially such as XRs or you know make with the dash J flag, which can do run things in parallel. So this page, uh, this manual page, parallel underscore alternatives gives a comprehensive view of how parallel compares with its you know contemporary alternatives. <clears throat> Uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, parallel is highly configurable. Uh, there are several flags that are available. So, I will, you know, kind of quickly go through these uh, features. And um, I also want to say that this is not an exhaustive list here. There are so many more flags available to configure parallel the way you would probably want to run. There, there is something available. Okay, so I'll start with you know keeping order. Although parallel doesn't run in order, but if you want the output in order, it would be delivered using the dash k flag. Dash j will control job slots. So, so if you want to limit the number of parallelism, you you would do it do it with dash j. If you want to group the arguments to a to a given number, then you would use uh, uppercase n flag. Um, if you want to kind of you know delay between the dispatching tasks then you can add some delay so that you know to 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 prevent overwhelming the system by lots of tasks dispatched at the same time uh, a timeout option is available if you want to you know run tasks but you are not sure if some task will hang or will not run then you can provide you know timeout seconds after which the task will uh, will be killed. Uh, it could also be provided by percentage of the median runtime of the other tasks. So, you know, if you think that uh, uh, maximum divergence for a set of tasks would be 200% of the mean, median, then you can provide that. Progress bar is available. It will show progress of your tasks. Uh, using progress dash dash ETA or dash dash bar flags, which are kind of you know self-explanatory. Dash dash WD will provide a working directory for your commands, so everything will be done related to that working directory. Dry run very useful. It will show what will run in the standard output, but will not run anything. Checkpointing and resuming is available. Um, Logging is available, although checkpointing and resuming works along with logging. So if you would like to resume uh, your, your job, uh, you know, if there is an anticipation that it will fail at some point, then you can use uh, this feature. A job log will maintain all the tasks in this run that has been completed with their exit status. So a resume flag will uh, only start those jobs that were not completed successfully. Additionally, you can provide retry failed or resume failed flags that would um, that would try the 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 failed jobs from either log or or if you want to start them fresh, ignoring the log. Uh, these kind, these configuration flags may be combined in a configuration file. Actually, in more than one configuration files, and they can be provided to GNU Parallel in at runtime in combinations. So, so you know they could be very useful for testing as well as you know they could be selected uh, depending on what kind of environment you you are running. For example. Uh, you can set process priorities to a lower uh, to a lower priority depending on you know how busy your system is or how um, how you want to run uh, those tasks uh, in, a, in a certain environment. Verbose feature is available, and those features can be combined and provided with the dash dash profile flag on the on the command line. Um, interestingly, parallel works very well over uh, over SSH with remote systems. Uh, there are several features available 
uh, dash s will you know will find the, the the server name provided and it will perform ssh connections and run the commands over uh, over ssh on the remote servers um, it can uh, it can also read the config file where you may have provided all the ssh specific configurations and it will follow those configurations uh, selective processes may be run on selective ssh remote hosts by grouping them like uh, as shown in this last line on this slide um, if you want to run certain processes on certain specific nodes they could be uh, they could be also configured likewise uh, so that said, there are certain uh, limitations uh, with GNU Parallel. Um, one that I found with the syntax is that, uh, you know, for example, if there is a command and it takes no arguments, uh, you still have to provide arguments. Um, and, uh, and to prevent GNU Parallel from, you know, from delivering those arguments to the commands, you need to provide the dash n zero flag. So only then it will run the, the command in parallel. So for example, in this example, uh, the, the command which takes no argument will run three times in parallel because those arguments will kind of act as dummy counters or, you know, so if you will index to the, uh, to the parallel. And, uh, 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 in terms of scaling as well, there are, uh, you know, some limitations where after a certain point, you get basically, you know, diminishing returns and, uh, you know, things may get plateaued. Although in the initial, uh, you know, initially when you increase the number of jobs, you get rapid scaling. However, you know, based on all the other constraints that typically you see in, you know, HPC systems such as IO or, or others, um uh, uh the returns may may start getting diminishing as you progress in increasing the degree of parallelism um so relevant to this to this training session uh gnu parallel is available on all the systems at the uh, at the facilities nurse olcf as well as alcf uh, on summit parallel is available as core software on you know, user bin parallel, so it should be available right away without, you don't need to load a module. On Crusher and Frontier, as well as on Perlmutter and Cori, it is available as a module. So you need to do module load parallel, and then it will be available to you. Uh, on Theta and Polaris at ALCF, it is available as a module named GNU-Parallel. Um, so I think that's all from my side. Uh, part two will be uh, continued by by Bill. Thank you. And I will stop sharing here. Uh, there. Right, and it is my turn to pick up the baton. Let's talk. Uh, maybe while you get ready, there's a few questions in chat. Um, so uh, Don is asking, does this work within the nurse job submission system, uh, like with SBatch? Can each of the jobs submitted under parallel uh, be MPI? Oh, oh parallel? I'll get to that. Okay. That's where we're going next. Okay. Yeah, that's where we are going. Yep. Okay. And Sam is asking, you know, parallel has to be installed on all remote hosts for this to work? No, it doesn't have to be. It only has to be installed. Uh, where it is being, uh, where the tasks are being dispatched to. Okay, thanks. All right, well, Promoter is up to date, so I can do this like on the system live, at least some of it. Uh, so here I am logged into Promoter. Uh, starting out default environment, parallel is not there. Module load parallel. And now and that's all you need to get access to it on Perlmutter. Uh, the first time you use it, there's going to be a little note about uh, citing it in your research, which I definitely encourage. Uh, 
Finding funding support for maintaining software, especially software as useful as this, is very important and often gets underlooked. So if you have a chance to cite GNU Parallel in, in a, a paper where it was of value to you, then please do so. Okay, well, I am on a login node and it is completely fine and reasonable to use Parallel on a login node to do useful utility things instead of you know, manually writing a loop or something like that. So let's go to a folder. Uh, uh, so imagine that I'm about to run a benchmarking test and I'm gonna do 10 runs of the same application and I need somewhere to put the data for that. So let's just do a tiny example where I'm going to parallelize a make directory command. And I am going to, so the naming convention that I want for these directories I'm gonna make is some number from one to 10 uh, underscore benchmark. Well, these are directories, so it doesn't need a dot. So that's gonna be the name of the directories I want. And then I am going to use the three colon syntax so that I don't have to do anything other than the one-liner to get this. And that ought to be it. Now I have 10 benchmark directories ready to go for the next step of whatever I'm working on. Uh, another alternative way to do the same thing uh, if instead of using the three colon syntax, I could have piped in a sequence command here. So a CQ one to 10, and then pipe that into parallel. Uh, I guess I should remove the directories before doing that. Wouldn't want to write the coattails of the previous example. All right, all my folders are gone. And here's the sequence version of the same command. And there they all are again, just as I want them. Uh, so all sorts of directory tree manipulation kinds of things, simple text editing things, find and replace, all that stuff is really convenient and easy to do with Parallel. Okay. Let's return to the slideshow. All right, so starting with the meat of things, using parallel on a compute allocation on a Perlmutter compute node or GPU node. Uh, you wanna start with a batch su submission script and you'll have your input file for you know, your, your list of tasks that you're putting into it. Uh, so this is not set up to use the training session information. That'll use a, a different QoS and uh, the reservation. Uh, this is using the debug QoS in contrast to the regular. Uh, I'm just requesting one node and I'm requesting the CPU nodes as opposed to the GPU nodes. Uh, and the actual meat of using parallel inside here is just module load parallel and then your parallel command just as it would have appeared in the login case. Uh, and I am showing that the, the input text that I've given this is just two, three, and four. So there's three tasks that you're expecting it to run. Uh, then from the login node, uh, sbatch command takes that script. Uh, I had a job ID. I waited in the queue for a few minutes. Uh, the debug queue moves quickly, and this is you know, uh, a 10 minute request by default. And when that was done, uh, if you don't explicitly name your, your output file, then it will uh, and whatever your job ID was. And I can view that file and I'll see that it successfully uh, echoed two, three, and four. So, with that simple framework and all of the sort of payload and actual work abstracted away, how do we actually get this to do real work? Uh, so the example application that I have here is something called Hammer 3. 
Uh, it's HMM search utility. It's a protein sequence similarity search that's used by bioinformatics. Uh, so there are some arguments that go to the command itself about how many threads it used, where should its output go, and it also needs two input files. Uh, one input file is used by the entire run, that's the reference database that it's searching against, and then there is a input, uh, it's called a FASTA file, which contains the protein sequences that you want to see if they're similar to your reference database or not. So I've got a data directory on Perlmutter Scratch that has 256 FASTA files in it. Like I started out with a very large database and if I tried to run it all at once, then it would take too long. So I wanna split this up and use parallel to get the entire thing done faster in one job. And you can see just by checking three of these files the, the pattern that I'm using for the file names is this uniprod underscore, and then a number, and then the file extension. Uh, so the first thing that I need to do is I need to create the input file that actually has the list of all 256 inputs so that I can give that to Parallel to, to use to, to kick off all of its tasks. And luckily, I don't have to do that manually. I can use Linux commands to do all of that hard work. And so the find command is the tool that I'm gonna to use to do that. Uh, in the data directory, if I use the find command and give it the current working directory and give it type F, so it's searching for files recursively in there, then the results of that will be uh, the full path to each one of those files. Uh, I can use grep to search out the FASTA file extension. So I make sure that I'm not getting any other kind of files in there, sort it and put it in input text. And that input text now has exactly the format that I want so that I can give each of these input files to parallel to run inside the compute allocation. And just a sanity check, making sure there are still 256 lines in the input file that it created. Uh, I'll also note that there is an example in the Git repository also using the find command to take a directory and turn its contents into a parallel input file. So the script written to run all of this, it ends up looking very similar to the single node example. I've got the, you know, I need six hours, a CPU, one node, I'm in the regular QoS. Uh, I still need the module load parallel command. And then the actual parallel, I'll put that in a Slurm S run. Uh, this, this has dry run on it. For actually running this, you would want to remove dry run, but that was uh, this command that I particularly cut out was uh, you know, sanity checking it. Note the dash J flag, that is jobs, and that is telling Parallel to limit how many tasks it is willing to run at the same time. So this will run up to 64 tasks, and when it gets to task 65, it will wait until at least one of the ones already going has finished. Uh, and that is very important because Parallel is not doing any sort of or binding affinity kinds of things that you may expect from sort of more higher power or more high performance computing culture kinds of commands. Uh, but luckily the Linux kernel is completely able to keep track of how many sort of cores and not make everything run on the same core and leave the rest empty. So this works well enough. Uh, if you have the number of jobs and the number of cores on your node, usually you will end up with the same number of tasks as the number of cores. Parallel is checking that on the system and trying to match that up. In some cases, like if your application uses a lot of memory or if it does a lot of uh, file IO, you may wanna choose a J number that is lower than the number of available cores. And that way you would avoid running out of memory or uh, avoid saturating the file system performance. 
So that's the dash J command. Uh, I have the actual command that I'm sending the GNU parallel. This is my full path to the HMM search application. The arguments that I'm giving to it. And here are the substitution characters where I'm actually using this input line to create the file paths that I need. The first thing that I want to do is I want to make sure that my output files are being written in exactly the same place as it found the input file. And that's why I'm making sure that the full path are in these task lists. So these two slashes in here, that takes the full path and it takes only the directory structure and it removes the file name and the extension. So that gives me a prefix and I can be sure that the output is going to go in the same directory as the input came from. Then I have some just text to say I want my output underscore to be the name. And then this slash dot notation inside the brackets. That's a different substitution that removes the directory and removes the extension, but keeps the file name. So I want to make sure that I can match output underscore and whatever it gives to the file name of the input that went in. So all of these, you know, uniprod underscore 100, 101, et cetera. And then add a text extension since this outputs in a, a text format. Then I have the uh, input file that is the same for every single run, just here with no substitution characters. And finally, the empty brackets giving the input file itself to the HMM search command. So with all of, okay. Oh, and one last thing, the dollar sign one here, that is how I am passing my input file to parallel from the outside of sbatch. So you can see in my sbatch command, pm.run.slurm is the script. And this input text is what I made with the find command. So I pass that as an argument and that goes in here into parallel. And then I submitted that and I checked SQS to see the queue state and I can see that my job was successfully in there and running. And after that finished, I could successfully confirm that all of the output files were in the data directory that I expected them to appear. So I checked the uh, content of that data directory on Perlmutter Scratch and looking for outputs. And the first three are successfully output underscore uniprod and then the file names that it pulled out. And there are successfully 256 of them, uh, exactly what I expected, one output for each task. So that's the core basic example of running uh, GNU parallel inside a single node application. And for a lot of things, that is going to be good and enough. Now, if we get more ambitious, it is possible to run high throughput workloads with GNU parallel inside a multiple node allocation. And the, there are a number of reasons to do this. Uh, you know, it's less work to set each one up. Uh, Perlmutter has a queue policy where only two jobs per user per allocation will move forward in the queue at a time. Uh, that's there to prevent users from clogging up and getting ahead with uh, lots of very short jobs. So the, the system and institution itself incentivizes wanting to put high throughput work into fewer larger jobs instead of lots of smaller jobs. And this is one of the most successful ways to do that. All right, so uh, start out with this payload.shell. That is the stand-in for whatever your my application is while working on this. Uh, it's just a simple bash script. It's got an echo that marks itself as that's a task and a argument so that it's passing some text through that that's how you identify it. But it also includes the hostname command. I'm going to use the output from the hostname command to confirm that it is actually running these tasks on different nodes in the allocation. And forget uh, your payload. If your payload is a shell script, uh, do the chmod to add the execute bit uh, so that you can actually run it when you give it to parallel. The next layer up is a parallel runner script. 
And this parallel runner script is the part that actually has GNU parallel inside of it with the module load, module load parallel that is nece necessary every time you're using it. There are two arguments being given to this script. Uh, the first one is going to the parallels-j argument. So if you want to set the number of jobs that it's running on each of the nodes, then you can do that. Second argument is the input task list that will be distributed amongst all of the parallels. So the structure that this is building is your slurm allocation job has multiple nodes in it. We're going to run a individual and unique GNU parallel instance on each one of those nodes. And then each one of those parallel instances is going to round robin take a entry from the task list and run it for itself. And the second node will take the second entry, the third node will take the third entry, and it will wrap around when you get to your full node list. The way that that is implemented here is using the awk command. So slurm underscore end nodes, that is an environment variable that is populated by slurm inside a job, and also slurm node ID. So end nodes is the number of nodes in the job, and node ID is the individual ID for each of the nodes in that job. So we can do a little bit of modulo arithmetic and a comparison to see if the line in your script, that's the NR, uh, comes from your node. Uh, and if the modulo on the number of nodes matches which node this is, then that means this is one of the tasks that belongs on this node as far as parallel concern. And then it pipes that into the parallel command. And the parallel command will run the payload.shell with the, the substitution for the command text. So that's that's the, the secret sauce for doing this. Uh, in comparison to other methods, something that you don't get doing this way is load balancing. If there's a lot of variation between how much compute your tasks need, this isn't going to be able to find empty nodes and full nodes and move things from full nodes to empty nodes because the round robin assignment of tasks to nodes is static. But if you have a lot of tasks and everything is you know, normally distributed as far as its run times or, or the same, then a lot of times this works out and you don't actually sort of lose much time on that tail end where there's only a few long running time uh, tasks left. If your workload does look like that, then you should probably choose a different tool that can handle load balancing between nodes. Okay, the, the final part of actually making this whole recipe work is the batch submission script itself. So there is just one of these, and that is allocating, in this example, two nodes, uh, setting number of tasks for node to one. And the way that we end up getting an individual parallel running on each of the nodes is srun is multiplying that out. By saying number of tasks two, I'm saying I want srun, give me two copies of parallel runner and put one of them on each node. So Slurm is taking care of assigning the parallel processes to each of the nodes and making sure that there's only one on each. And then this has also got a uh, argument syntax. So the sbatch command itself will get the number of jobs that you want to run on each node through the parallel dash j and also the task list. Uh, so the example, the input text is just three tasks with these numbers. The sbatch itself, uh, pm multi dot slurm, two jobs per node maximum and the input text. Submitted, waiting in the queue. Uh, and another sanity check that you can do is once the job is allocated, uh, you can use S account and this uh, dash O node list. And that shows me the name of the compute nodes that have been assigned to my job. So I have node ID 5755 and 6153. And the reason that I want that is I want to make sure that the host name outputs match up to what actually is being run on my job. And once the Slurm output is available for that job, I can see I've got task three, task two, task four. 
I didn't tell it to output those in order. This is fine. That's the, the whole roster that I'm expecting. And I can see that two of them ran on 6153 and one of them ran on 5755. So with that same framework, if you have a real application of more substance than just an echo and a host name, uh, you substitute similar to the way that I changed the first example uh, to add HMM search in there. Okay. All right, so we'll spend some time mentioning when it is a good idea and when it is not a good idea to use GNU Parallel. High throughput computing is the use case. Lots of copies of the same command in no particular order. And this is probably my favorite part about GNU Parallel is it is focused on doing exactly one thing well, which is very much sort of the, the Linux uh, design philosophy for support commands. Uh, write programs that do one thing and do it well. If you want something else, instead of adding features to it, uh, write another program. And so this makes it very easy to sort of conceptualize the model of when you use this, and that's when you want lots of copies of the same command in no particular order. Do you care about the order that the tasks are run? Is there some sort of uh, directed acyclic chain of dependencies? Does something need to finish before something else? Uh, does something need to be you know, retried and have relationships with other forms of data that aren't ready yet? If that's the case, you shouldn't use GNU Parallel. You should be paying attention to some of the tools that come further on in this presentation, because they do have the capability to track uh, dependencies, to check the input data is available before starting running something, uh, that kind of thing. Are your tasks using MPI? If your application is an MPI application, you probably don't want to use GNU Parallel. Yes, it is technically possible that it could work. Uh, you could put your S run or MPI run or other launching command inside the parallel script. So the parallel is sort of on the outside and orchestrating multiple of those. And that could be made to work, but it's probably going to be a lot of extra work and kind of wasteful relative to just choosing a different tool. Uh, like SRUN has a lot of this similar functionality, functionality already baked into it, but with the added ability of being able to understand uh, the process management interface API and set up MPI communicators and that sort of thing. So I don't recommend putting an MPI application into this, but if you really needed to, then it could be made to work. Do any of your tasks or the sum of all their running time not fit within the maximum job well time? So each institution or machine is going to have its own policies as far as how many jobs you can have, how long they can run. If your job needs a week to run and you can only get two days in the queue, then GNU Parallel is not going to help you solve that problem. Uh, that one's kind of obvious, but say, um, you have one day long jobs and you have a very large number of them to the point that you would need to fill up the entire machine with something that runs longer than the maximum well time. Uh, GNU Parallel is not going to work well for you. Uh, and the reason for this is sort of the way that it keeps track of state. There's in workflow management tools, there are different ways to keep track of your state, which is what's the state of my tasks that are running, are finished, what still needs to be run. Genio Parallel is just an application, so it's storing this information in memory. When it ends, that information goes away besides any logging that it left behind. So it's not suitable for a long campaign. If you need to keep running material simulations for months at a time, keeping that Genio Parallel process alive the entire time. You know, something may crash, the, not, the node that it's on may go down, and you'll, you'll have to sort of rebuild from the logging it left behind. 
In those cases, you would rather use a tool that has either some sort of uh, file system tracking of you know what's what job are these in mind, what tasks are in, in play, what's the state of those things, or a tool that has a database backend, which is also storing the same information, but in sort of a more reliable and portable manner. And that's going to be some of the tools that are further on in the day have that longevity to them. Uh, so the, the division of labor here is GNU Parallel is for quick and easy, do a lot of the same thing. And if you need more complexity in that space, or if you need something that's going to live a long time, then you want to move towards one of the more advanced tools with a stronger backend. All right. Uh, so that is the extent of the con content I have available. Thanks for your attention. Uh, I can, oh, I'll do questions in the Slack or the Google Doc if they haven't already been gotten by the uh, other staff members. And we will go on break. Uh, the content will resume at 9.15 with Parcel. So, yeah. Thanks for your attention, everyone.
Okay, we're ready to go. Yep. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, tutorial number two on our uh, DB Woofer training day. We will talk, Tyler and I will be uh, talking about uh, Parcel today. And uh, we started a little different in that uh, first, we're going to cover um, how you're going to run this tutorial. Um, so we, we will, this tutorial will be given as a Jupyter notebook. So um, if you have a training accounts, if any accounts at like NERSC, um, OSCF, ALCF, uh, we'll first show the instructions, or you can download the instructions from our GitHub repo. And then you can uh, use the time, you know, while we're talking to set up uh, your Jupyter Notebook. And I will just briefly show how it's done for the NERSC training account. And then I will show the instructions for OSCF and ASA. Uh, so what you need to do is you need to go to jupyter.nurse.gov. Um, you will need to sign in with your training confidentials, or if you already have NERSC with your NERSC confidentials. And then uh, you need to select the Jupyter instance. The demo has been uh, only, it's only for Perlmutter. Choose a Perlmutter one. Um, so for this one, I encourage you to take a configurable job because it allows you to um, put in the reservation that we have at NERSC for this particular tutorial. So if you click on that, if you click on that button, um, you will prompt it with these options menu. And what you would have to do is you have to select say, a training account if you want to use it. That's N train seven. Uh, I think as you want to use the reservation, you have to use N train seven here. Then uh, constraint CPU, um, QS regular, 128 tasks, no GPUs, and reservation pick DOE workflows 2023 CPU. And for if you only need it for the duration of this presentation, uh, choose a sensible time limit um, like 90 minutes. And um, let me let me see it worked before. Um, so let me show you how that is done. Okay, okay. Cache my credentials doesn't matter. Um, configurable job. Then you want to go. All right. Um, you pick your the N train seven training count, constraint CPU, regular, and GPUs, our reservation. Okay, well, brilliant. Um, um it just worked a couple of minutes ago. Awesome. Uh, well, let me just go on, go on with like the other instructions. So if you were to use, um, if you actually landed on the uh, Jupyter Hub page, you need to clone our repository first. And then if you want to set up the part, the parts environment, you just have to execute um, the script below. And that will uh, populate um, a kernel spec for you for Jupyter and will make um, the kernel available for you uh, for that uh, notebook. And if you were at ASCF, um, you need to open a shell and follow these instructions. You will also find the instructions in the README on the GitHub repo. But essentially, you would have to establish uh, an SSH tunnel and um, then uh, run the notebook and uh, forward the port uh, onto your browser, and then you exit you uh, access it access it at localhost uh, here ninety nine hundred uh, with the token, and then you should be able to um, to run your uh, notebook. And I think um, I think we after this is the lunch break, so if you have any trouble, we can probably help you out uh, in the lunch break. The instructions for OSCF are similar. Um, you know, you uh, establish a tunnel, you clone the repo, you load Python, and you, you activate the Python environment and go to the and uh, run the Jupyter notebook and then navigate on your local computer um, to that address. Okay. All right. So, what is Parcel? 
Uh, Plaza uh, was started in 2017 by Yadu and Kyle at UChicago Organ National Lab, and it provides an intuitive Pythonic way of fertilizing codes by annotating apps with, uh, with decorators. And these apps then execute concurrently uh, while respecting the data dependencies. So if they have different, if, you know, separate dependencies, they can, you know, run at the same time. And um, the idea is that you separate the config from the exit execution. So if you if you write your your pipeline or your workflow once, the only thing that you have to change afterwards is the config. But in principle, um, what you code it up as a workflow uh, should run anywhere. And the motivation uh, for Parcel is that uh, software is intrinsically assembled rather than, than written. And that's also uh, due to the success of Python and the SciPy uh, ecosystem is that you, you know, it's easy to glue uh, pieces of code together. And um, yeah, that's, uh, that, you know, makes it, it's just more practical to start with something that people already have done. And at the same time, um, parallel distribu distributed computing um, is everywhere. And that's because um, the single thread uh, performance of CPUs has kind of plateaued out. And also there's uh, more and more data available. So more, more and more data has been used. So you need to distribute um, the computer uh, load over multiple uh, processes. And also, um, you know, also part due to the fact that you're kind of at the end of most law, the, the resources are becoming increasingly heterogeneous. So parcel is one way um, to, uh, to keep up uh, with that trend. So um, it can be executed in very different ways. Um, parcel separates, like, has, a, has multiple layers of hierarchy. Um, so for example, for an HPC system, you wanna choose like the high throughput executor, um, but it also executes for other uh, systems. And then underneath, uh, it has the providers. So it has providers for all kinds of um, uh, resources, the compute resources that you could, can access in the computing landscape. So what's the, the benefit of Parcel? Um, well, Parcel is, is all Python and it's very easy to install. It has no, uh, no database dependencies. It's uh, been designed for large scale computing in mind. It has a very strong documentation. And um, yeah, so you can you can run you can write everything if you're like a Python lover, and I am one of those. You can just write everything in Python and use Parcel as your uh, parallel scripting uh, library. And the you know there's there's benefits to to using uh, Parcel. So if you abstract away all the complexities of HPC, you know at some point you need to address it. And there is the that is actually um, uh, like a small uh, negative part, you will actually have to still have to understand what kind of system you're running on because you still have to configure um, parcel properly under the hood so that you are, um, that all your apps or your workflow executes efficiently. And, you know, figuring out how executor, provider, and launcher and everything uh, relates to each other or relates to Slurm or any other uh, scheduler, it's quite a learning process, but they do have um, some great uh, resources. And other things to look out is that you know it's you 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 sh shoot off the function to your workers, so they don't, and then they they execute it and they return the result, but they don't actually keep uh, state or whatsoever. So if you if you were if you are in the mood of like I have like a bunch of worker processes that do different tasks and I just feed them new information, that's not really uh, how it's done. So you have to um, consider that your workers are stateless. Um, you know, as I mentioned. Um, the cool thing about it is that Parcel was created with high performance speed in mind, so it can easily schedule to like um, thousands of tasks per second. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of, um, you know, be a bit, you have to take a good measure at it because um, if you run many, many tasks, um, then you can't make the task. Um, you know, too small. So there has to be there's some there's some bandwidth limitation in, in talking with a um, with the data flow kernel. So you have to make sure that when if you scale if you scale up to more and more nodes, you should the task should have like a certain duration. Um, but there's a nice publication out there that you can scale up to 
250,000 workers and 8,000 nodes. So uh, it's worth checking that one out and reading it. It's a good read. And um, other thing is also cool. It's like it's not it's not so heavy on the logging part, um, you know, which can be quite a burden if it if uh, if the file system is just overloaded uh, with more many uh, small files. So that's another advantage. And uh, I think from this point on, uh, Tyler will take over. All right, thank you, Bjorn. Um, so while I'm pulling up the slides on my screen share, my name is Tyler Skluzacic. I am a research scientist at Oak Ridge National Lab, and also a, what did Bjorn say earlier, a Python lover, a parcel user, and I'm happy to be here with all of you today. So I'm going to dive a little bit under the hood of Parcel just to see at like a basic level how it works. Um, I do have pointers to you know other resources as well for learning more about Parcel, uh, but I'm hopefully this you know whets your appetite and leaves you wanting to learn more. So as Bjorn said, it's incredibly easy to install Parcel. It's literally just a pip install Parcel in your Python environment. Uh, so you know. Parcel is Python first and kind of Python only. So parallelism in Parcel is by using something called an app. So if we look over here on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, what you'll see inside of this decorated Python app is what looks to you and me like a Python function we've all seen a million times, right? Def hello, return hello world. Uh, so basically all you're doing is saying, all right, this hello function, is something that I want to perhaps at some point during my application execution run concurrently. Um, so it supports, I said Python only, but it also supports bash apps, right? Just represented in Python. And so for example, you might see here that if you have some sort of external library, non-Pythonic library you wanna call as well, um, you can implement a bash app as well, handle where standard out and standard error go, um, and effectively write uh, your code in a very similar fashion. And so. These apps don't necessarily return a result right away, right? Because a lot of when we send something off, it's like the, our tests, they sit in the queue, then they have to go to the computer and it, we get our nodes and it takes some time, right? So if you send off hello.result, it's not necessarily, you know, two milliseconds and it's right back in your pocket. Uh, you need some method of going back and getting the result later. And so, for example, Parcel provides futures built upon the Python futures. Uh, that allow you to say, hey, I want to execute this app, but I will wait for it until it comes back. You can also do this asynchronously via a done command. So you can just keep checking, like, is it done yet? No, do something else. Is it done yet? No, do something else. Um, apps run concurrently respecting data flow dependencies. And so it's natural parallel programming. So really what you're doing is you're just writing your natural Python, annotating the places with these decorators about the things that could be run concurrently. And then the parcel uh, data flow kernel, which we'll talk about in a second, does some level of thinking to construct a DAG and uh, figure out exactly what runs where at what time. And so what's also nice about parcel and you know why it's a good candidate to be in a cross facility tutorial is parcel scripts are independent of where they run. You write them once, you run them anywhere. So for example, the tutorial that uh, Bjorn and myself are about to walk you through, you could run a very similar script on you know, Summit, Polaris, or Nurse, uh, Perlmutter. Um, but the moral of the story is you have one parcel config that you change between the demos, but it's the same idea. And so we're not gonna spend too much time on the hello world today, but I do encourage people if they want to you know, go get a taste of like getting started in Parcel, uh, to go to parcelproject.org, check out Binder. Um, if you cut off the Binder at the end, you're on the Parcel website and can learn a lot there as well. And so just kind of looking at the difference in parallelism between, you know, just base sequentially written Python and Parcel, let's take this imaginary function where you might double a number. And then let's say you want to double a number, double it again, and add those doubles together. So in Python, you call the function once, do the work, return the work, call the function again, do the work, return the work, and then can finally print at the very end, right? Parcel is a little bit different in that, let's say a function is a Python application and you have like this, you know, what would you call it? Like your native application. Uh, it can see that, you know, 
hey, we're doing the same thing twice without any necessary dependencies on each other. We're going to launch task two and task three at the same time. And then uh, here, the print d1.result plus d2.result is literally just waiting on two futures rather than, you know, like you can fly through d1, it returns, uh, it just executes, return d2 executes, and then you're just waiting for those finally result, final results. And so how exactly does this work? So when you're developing a workflow, it's a two-step process. And our fun previous example is right here. Um, so we just take our functions, we annotate them, and we specify dependencies between functions using standard Python code. This is basically here a second time to like hammer home, like you don't have to do, go do any weird deck programming if you don't want to. And so when you make a call to an app, it returns immediately, like double five and double three return immediately. Um, generating a task in the data flow kernel, which I'll talk more about in a second, but what it's returning are futures to the Python script. And so these futures are pretty flexible. You can sit there and wait on them, or you could pass them to other apps as inputs, um, establishing a dependency. And so Parcel will look at, you know, your apps and your, or your tasks and the dependencies between the tasks and automatically construct that directed acyclic graph. Um, and one important thing to note is this graph is not computed in advance, but it's dynamically constructed and updated as you execute your script. So it completes when the script finishes executing. So this is what you call like a dynamic deck. The data flow kernel for a second, uh, how this, you could almost think of this as being like the brain of parcel. And so what it's responsible for is constructing and orchestrating the execution of that task graph. And as we just mentioned before, it doesn't need all the information right away, but just as you um, are running your Python code, submit tasks one at a time to the data flow kernel. And the DFK will go ahead and check, you know, are the dependencies met? Uh, do we just store the task and wait till later? Uh, do we have a cache result for the task and decide on some sort of executor on which to run it? So the executor is now where things get interesting. So if you think of this data flow kernel as like the brain, the executor is almost like the muscle, like the thing that'll go out there. It'll get your nodes via whatever provider you have. So whether it's Slurm, um, LSF at, on Summit, uh, anything of that sort, it will establish some sort of management on that resource. So this could be you know, a supercomputer, a cloud, a workstation. It'll create some sort of manager uh, input the tasks and then route them to the workers and then send the results back up to the DFK. So the DFK is also responsible for making sure that this future is eventually fulfilled. And so uh, if tasks have their data dependencies met, they can be executed concurrently. If not, you have to wait before you execute something and they'll run in parallel, uh, entirely in parallel if the executor has enough resources and workers. Otherwise, they'll just sit here until you know the executor comes back and says, um, I need more. Oops. And so the executor that's uh, kind of the focal point of our demo today, and I think it's the, someone can correct, at Parcel can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's one of the most used uh, ex executors is the high throughput executor. That's really good for high throughput jobs. So uh, earlier we you know mentioned that Parcel scales really well. So this htex as it's known, uh, supports up to 2,000 nodes, can run millions of sub-second tasks, um, and also these longer tasks that have some level of required fault tolerance in order to execute. And in this high throughput executor, you have a few key pieces. So you have the interchange. So this is kind of like a pilot job model. So you have this interchange that might sit outside of your nodes. Um, and this is receiving the task from the data flow kernel. Uh, it has an internal task queue. Um, and it balances load across all your managers. And then on each node, you'll have a manager that is just responsible for one, connecting back to that interchange and two, distributing work to the workers. So it's really communicating like the worker status to the interchange and just passing tasks through. Um, there's all sorts of optimizations you can make in Parcel. I'm not gonna talk about many of them today. I'm about to show resources on where you can learn more, but uh, for example, they support prefetching, batching, uh, memoization. There's even, you know, monitoring support if you go back up one slide to one step outside the HDEX. Um, and so one thing that is also important here that I didn't note 
is that they're exchanging heartbeat messages. So you don't want workers to just, you know, keep working till the end, end of time. If a node goes down, there has to be some sort of communication about, hey, we might need to resubmit something, um, report that back to the DFK, report that back to the interchange. Uh, so that's the very whiplashy version of kind of what's going on in Parcel. I feel like if there's, I, I will say like, like, let's say a whole demo today at Webpetite, or you're already becoming proficient in Parcel. Uh, one thing I would say is, you know, there, there are full day Parcel, you know, events such as Parcel Fest that you could attend. I know Bjorn and I have been to quite a few of them and it's, you know, Parcel has a very strong community and active community. Um, always willing to help. And so Parcel Fest is kind of this fun yearly event where all of these people working on Parcel plus the Parcel development team all get together and just talk about cool things they built in Parcel, cool new features, things like that. Uh, I'd highly recommend reading the Parcel paper. Uh, as you know, Bjorn mentioned earlier, there's all sorts of these little pieces like providers and executors and like all these necessary pieces to do this uh, generally configurable system across all these resources. Uh, there's a lot of information in that paper that I'd highly recommend. Um, I'll jump all the way over to the right. So if you do start building something in Parcel, the active community extends to their Slack channel. So the Parcel project on Slack, I would highly recommend joining. And then there's also a new product called FunkX, which is a federated function as a service program that uses, you know, Parcel, it, it's built a top parcel, but it's a very, very parcel like ecosystem for just, you know, creating these endpoints that sit at nodes and then you can remotely functions. And so people have built some really cool use cases out of that so far. So that's also worth checking out. And then at this point, I am passing it back to Bjorn. Uh, correct. One second. Um, so does it look right again? Looks good. Okay. All right. We pointed out parser is just you can start with pip, you can start with conda. You know, the typical way you you module out the Python of the conda environment at the HP center, you create a new uh environment um for parser, you install parser, and then you're usually uh you're good to go. So the the tricky things uh for parcel is to configure it right for your hpc system and they do have a lot of examples already uh, on the web page and we do have example at nurse on our docs page but i just want to give you like a like a short brief um, um overview about what you need to consider so here in the on the right you have like um an absolute um basic representation of an hpc data data where you have like uh an HPC cluster with lock and compute nodes and you know some other uh, peripheral nodes or like an on on-premise on cloud. So the usual thing is that you start like you log in, you end up on a login node, and then if you want to go and, and submit a compute job, you have to go through S batch to get nodes allocated and then execute your workload with S run, for example. So if you're looking for um, the most common use case, which is like uh, that you have a, a a uh, long or like a semi-permanent pilot process mm -hmm. that hosts the data flow kernel that actually has the uh, the con the that loads the config. Um, that is usually uh, placed on a logger node or a workflow node, and then it will um, will talk with a with a local resource manager uh, to get um, compute nodes to run the the workers on. And for example, uh, at Nurse, because you're using Slurm, you would have to use the Slurm provider to get nodes allocated to you. And then you can, uh, if it's, and then you have to use an S run launcher, for example, uh, to, to run the, the worker jobs um, in it. And these, uh, the data flow kernel and the, and the workers that talk back with each other, as we've seen in, uh, in Tyler's OU slide with all these, um, with, the, with the data flow kernel. So there's a lot of talking back and forth. Um, 
And if you do this one, you have to also make sure that your that the process where you launch the Airflow kernel is staying alive after you log out. Um, but I think the most important thing to point out is here that the student provider essentially has a wraparound as batch. So you will be hit by all the limitations that uh, the um, the HP center puts on using um, the scheduler. For example, at NURSE, we have a rate limit. We have a limit on how many jobs you can submit at the same time, for example. So now if you if you, um, you have your very granular workflow that you know submits block each block in its own allocation, um, you know, it might, it might uh, happen that two of them will get scheduled a million, the other one will wait until you know your two first blocks have executed. So this is something to look out for. And I'm I'm not necessarily convinced that this is the best best way, but but many people choose this as the as the first um, uh, uh, implementation uh, config implementation for Parser. How does it look like uh, in practice? So you have this uh, you in, you import all the uh, providers, launchers, and executors, and then you set up this config. And here's like an example config from uh, our docs page. You see that there's this learn provider. Um, as a wrap around the re local resource manager, and then there's the S1 launcher to actually uh, launch the um, the worker pool. And if you follow the link down, you, you get like a bit more explanation on our docs page. Um, so since this this um, since this uh, setup kind of collides with with the policies in HPC Center, another one is a kind of a headless run of parcel. So this is uh, kind of the the preferred way to launch it uh, if you have like a, a boxed workflow, something that doesn't really have to interact with the outside or that is not you know doesn't doesn't get fit new information. And then uh, what you can do is you can submit you know all your Python script and all the the, the base script where you load the config uh, just regular over as batch, and then the data flow kernel runs on on node zero of your allocation concurrently with all the workers. And so this is kind of a really, um, you know, close packed um, setup. So that's really resilient too. And then also the, the benefits also, you don't have to worry about keeping your process on the login out alive because this will run unattended, unattended for the scheduler. Um, okay. And if you want to use this one, um, you the, it looks pretty similar. Uh, one thing to look out for, since you're not talking with the scheduler anymore and you don't need to allocate um, uh, your resource blocks, you will choose a local provider instead. But you can still use the S1 launcher to launch individual um, uh, worker pools inside that allocation. And again, you can take a look at the docs below. And you might have wondered why I have put like this other box to the left for on-premise cloud or peripheral nodes. Um, this is something that has been we've been asked like uh, more than one time is why don't we run the data flow kernel inside, for example, spin networks, because it will allow you to have like the, the data flow kernel combined with like a web front end um, to, to steer the, the workflow. But there's is some it's a bit that's a bit problematic because these peripheral nodes or your cloud might not have uh, the local resource management exposed, so you can't actually use the Slurm provider. Instead, you would have to wrap a facility API, like for example, a super facility API. And then the other thing is the workers have to talk with the data flow kernel. And if you have like um, string uh, strict uh, rules for ports and uh, and the network between these uh, two separate clusters, um, then this might also be uh, problematic. But I think it's, it's still compelling. Currently, it's just not really practical. Okay, with these with these three um, uh, different deployment modes, I'm gonna we're gonna jump into the tutorial now. And uh, the tutorial um, we have uh, been given from the the, the Exaworks team. It's a molecular design uh, demo, and the 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 goal of this. Um, a demo is to identify high value molecules among a search page of billions of candidates. And um, the, the problem here is that, you know, simulating all of them is quite expensive. And the, the idea is that you only simulate like a few to get like a feel how it, yeah, the ionization energy um, relates to the structure formula. And then you train a neural network on it. And then you kind of 
pick a, pick your candidates based on what the what the new network gives you like that's good candidates and then you rerun the a simulation and you do this like in a in a closed loop okay um right let's see So this will all be all live. Let's see how, how good we fare. So here's the here yeah, locked into Jupiter uh, with the training account. I cloned um, our repo here. And now the last thing to do and uh, is to actually set up um parcel for this one okay so this installed the kernel spec uh, for it so we now navigate to the demo And you see it has picked up the parcel, uh, the, the con environment that we created. Um, so this should be all be good to go now. So let's see. So yeah, I also, also um, we summarize what you need to do to rerun that demo at the beginning of the, the notebook. So if you ever want to redo it, you know, it's just right, right on the, on the top, the, the necessary steps. Okay. Um, so uh, I, we already mentioned that we're going to simulate um, uh, molecules here, the immunization energy of molecules with the package of views called uh, XTB. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up the config um, for, for parcel. So we need to uh, load a bunch of modules and load a bunch of um, other stuff. And now the next thing is to set up uh, the compute environment. So um, for NERSC, since we, what we can what we have chosen, we chose to configure uh, CPU for the for Jupiter, which means that this notebook already runs on um, on a compute node. So we don't actually need to work with the schedule anymore. We already have like one node allocated uh, for this particular notebook. So that we uh, we'll be using a local provider here to uh, to run the notebook, the data the possibility. So as we execute it, we now see that the data flow kernel has been launched. And from this point onward, uh, really, um, all the notebooks, even if you have different um, um, different folders for parcel, for nurse, OLC, FIS, there from this point, uh, they're all kind of the same. Um, so let me go through this like step by step. Uh, the first uh, part is to load um, the, the um, the, the table with all the different molecules in it. Uh, and then we set up like how many calculations we want to run first and how much how much uh, molecules we want to investigate overall and how much molecules we want to run in each of these um, uh, closed loop simulations. So these are the, the three big parameters for um, the closed loop um, simulation and model and training workflow. So the, the whole, um, um, the whole con environment already came with a bunch of functions that um, that are provided in chem functions that provide that kind of just abstract away a bit of the calculations. Um, but here, what we do is we're gonna we're gonna go forward and run first simulation. Um, uh, Bjorn, can we ask a question? Oh, sure. I don't see that. Somebody uh, wanted to know how do you choose the max uh, workers. I mean, you can play really. So you shouldn't. I'm. You shouldn't choose it larger than the amount of um, CPUs you have. So I would say a hard limit would be. I would. I would say let's keep it on that 128 or less. Yeah. But I mean, you can. I think. I think what the the cool thing you can do once you are on your own, you can try to optimize this book, this notebook, and play with these parameters. You know, you can also. Um, uh, you know, play with this and the other ones and just see how much faster you can get it or how much more molecules you can analyze. You know, that's the, that's the, that's the beauty here. 
um, I keep keep it close to the original um, uh, to the original notebook that the Exodus would publish. So I didn't I didn't go overboard here at the beginning. Um, okay. Um, let's see. We have um, plenty of time. All right. Okay. Um, all right. So this the. I think what it starts with, uh, it starts with with uh, zero. Zero is apparently the smiles formula for water. Um, so and if, since we wrap the, the actual function in a Python app, um, when we execute it, we'll get a future. That's what um, I already mentioned. So you get an app future uh, in return, and then um, we evaluate the result and uh, that's the ionization energy of water is apparently 18 uh, electron volt. All right. So the next thing is to um, to scale up um, the simulation. Um, so we don't want to actually call a result um, for, to be ready because instead we want to have like all these jobs farmed out to the different workers. So um, the way to do it, let's see. Um, well, just submit it first. And then the 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 way to do it is to use this uh, as completed. So what it, what happens is that we will we we'll go and um, uh, check for the the list of futures and only take a look at you know what has been what has been done. So once the once you um, once one of the simulations over, you remove it from the list of um, from the list of calculations that you need to do, and then you take a look at uh, how it fared, for example, it could it could fail, and then you would want to might want to redo it, and otherwise you print the out you print uh, the result. Let's do this. Okay, since I was talking, it already uh, did everything <laughs> behind. We can just do it again. Uh, let's see. Because then I see that how like um, some of these compute some of these computations return and give you like a result. Okay, there's another question. Yes, you can set. I think you can set max workers to the number of processes of number of. I would say number of CPUs. I mean, you can definitely yeah number of ranks. I think it's not ranks because we're not launching um, we're launching just a single task, so there will be just one rank. Um, but I think the number of 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 cores, I would say, should be the number of max workers. Tell you if that helps you. If you get the entire node. Oh, I think tasks here fail. Um, I think the simulate it's just part of that um, that simulation package that it's not. I don't actually I don't actually know. Um, but um, some of these simulations can actually fail. Um, uh, yeah, so I think if you, if you buy any, if you, if you're in your, if you try to get this notebook running, but if you haven't uh, gotten it running, um, you can also go to the Exaworks uh, page where the, the link is provided in the slides. And then you can launch the binder there and just run the same notebook that we do here, but just with the, with the, uh, with the setup they, they provide. Okay. Um, Okay. All right. Uh, so we just put this all in data frame. Um, so next, the uh, next part is uh, we want to train machine learning model to screen um, for candidate molecules. So this will be done uh, with scikit-learn. I'm not going to read all the different other uh, sentences here, but essentially we now make a, a Python app. Uh, like another possible app that can actually um, uh, train a model based on the simulated data. So this is the uh, source of app for this. So now we uh, go and make one um, one future of this uh, of this app and see how it how it went. I think now we know. Um, we're just going to run one future. 
Okay. Um, so now, so now the next thing is to kind of combine um, the the simulation training um, and uh, and the the running of a model with like in a closed loop workflow. Um, so we're gonna what we're gonna do next is we're gonna stitch the apps uh, together. We're gonna define two more apps. One is like the the way to when we run the model, and then uh, the other one is to combine all the uh, different results because we don't run the model in parallel, like in batches over the entire um, data set um, or the entire uh, table. Um, okay, so just gonna go forward here. This uh, this actually uh, does the prediction, and the other one um, will combine all the different inferences from the prediction. And um, yeah, so I think we just power through here. The next part is that we um, split up the um, the overall search base in, in chunks of 64 entries. And this is uh, what you see here is that it will run um, the model on on the uh, on the trained it will it will run the model that has been trained with the simulated data set for all the different chunks. So this will be run since this this will be run then in parallel. And then uh, the the output, the interfer the inference futures will be combined with the with the second with the third stage here uh, with this app. Okay. And then this is then the results of essentially one run where it picks you know um, a number of where it picks like uh, some of these. Um, uh, molecules. Here you see the, the 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 row number, the molecule, and the ionization energy. And then, um, so what what this is actually done is that we have we made a model. Uh, we made like um, we trained a model based on the initial simulations to find good candidates for further simulation. Data set. So this is this is essentially like one row. So what the only thing that's left is to repeat this over and over again. So, um, so the final um, app is the final the final thing we see is this. So it is um, it does the same stuff. We select our we select our samples. We run the simulation, and then we train the model, et cetera, et cetera, and we do it over and over again, just because it takes a while. Um, just gonna let this run. So we like you see that it has has simulated one um, molecule out of sixty four molecules in total that we want to look at. So let's see if there's another question. Okay, well Yadu is on it. Great, thanks Yadu. <laughs> yeah, it runs eagerly. So, it, um, but the result might it's just it passed the future, so the result might not get it ready. I think it would define it would um, you know um, not fit the purpose if it would only be run when you call the result call. That's like not that's not as in us now. Okay, so far so good. Tyler, anything to add? I was I think I was I was a bit fast for this one, but I think it's it's a very very uh, exhaustive notebook. So every every single detail is explained here. So I encourage uh, every person to just like go through it, you know, step by step, um, and read it, and be self-explanatory. Yeah, uh, I mean, just what I add and what I take away from this notebook is this notebook obviously isn't a hello world example. So, like, if you are interested in getting started with Parcel, this is really cool for showing how you can take a giant existing Python code base and run it with these little concurrent parts. Um, but if you are interested in, you know, starting from the ground up, do hit the tutorials or the resources I put in the slides, uh, because those will be great tools for learning and working your way up to understanding what everything in this notebook is doing. But yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it's a great example of how you just take things that are already out there and, and you know, patch it together and, you know, with, with very little, well, Maybe not little effort, but with comparatively little extra lines of code, you make it into something very powerful.
All right. I just saw someone ask, how does Parcel compare to Dask? I know performance-wise, that's in the uh, Parcel paper. Um, yeah. Check it out. I think it's um, it scales a bit better to uh, to when you have like more and more workers. It scales better to higher nodes. But I think Yadu is the best to to answer that question. It's actually pretty similar. Yeah. I'm not sure how to answer that question, really. It, it's designed for completely different sorts of workloads. I, I'll just start with that. So if you have like a bunch of tasks that you want to chain together and run on a cluster as a computer, Parcel works very well. If you have uh, Pandas data framey style things that you want to process across a bunch of nodes, Dask makes, makes more sense. Does that, um, hopefully think, that answers your question. I think Dask has like two flavors. One is Dask distributed, where it's kind of like a workflow and dark engine. And the other thing is where, where you have like these gigantic arrays that you want to actually essentially have the same kind of code run on, but then, you know, have it scattered across different nodes. Yeah. Um, so how does Alex, Alex ask, how does Parcel interact with, uh, with Python classes? Um, so what's, what exactly is the question, uh, Alex? What do you mean by how does it interact with Python classes? If I have a Python class with some functions, can I call Parcel decorated inside the class? That's huh. a great question, no. Uh, because uh, once you have a class and you want to execute functions on that class in a distributed context, now suddenly your functions have state. And Parcel does not do stateful workers. Um, if you are interested in behavior like that, you might want to look at Ray. Along the lines of what we are discussing right now. So what will happen if I just make a Python app which calls my class with however many variables and appropriate values? Do you see what I'm saying? So my Python app will instantiate my class and run it for me and store the result in a future, which I will get by dot result. Yeah, I mean, if I would take a first step at the answer, answering your question is like the, the thing that's inside a Python app in Parcel is almost like a self-contained little Python script. So it should have all the dependencies in it. And you just like, you know, pass like easily pickable Python objects in between, you know, apps. So if you, if you, if you import everything, you instant instantiate the class inside your Python app, and just you know pass along things that are easily you know standard objects that are easily pickable. I think then we should be fine. Okay, cool. Thank you. I mean, yeah, my, is it correct? Is it roughly? Nope, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, All right. And I also, think yeah. Um, we are done with the simulation. Just um, so now we can have this plot, and and this is the right. This is the right way um, how it should look like. So yes, all the the different molecules that we tried in time, and you see that it kind of uh, that this uh, loop model, this this workflow enabled you to pick molecules with higher and higher ionization energy. So you know, in the end, we found a bunch of candidates that have very high ionization energy, and that's the that was the purpose. And you you were able to do this without actually having to run simulation. Uh, against the entire um, entire table, uh, which you know, obviously you can totally uh, do if you wanted to, but you know, this 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 example was to just to get around this. Um, sorry, there was a question. I was who was speaking last? Um. I, I guess while that person is on their way back, I will say, uh, I'll echo Chris' comment from the chat that well, you did just watch the NERSC demo, and I think people are also running it on ALCF and OLCF um, concurrently. 
but those uh, demos with their proper configurations are available uh, on the GitHub as well. So regardless of your computing institution, if you're one of those three, uh, there's a notebook for you uh, present there. Yeah. May I ask a, a pathological question here? It's it's uh, one of the problems that I have encountered when I tried to use the Bash app feature in uh, Purcell. May I? Uh, sure. Why not? Yeah. So um, the idea was, so there are lots of Bash environmental variables someone might have to set up to get a appropriate performance from an application, for example. So is it possible that I can have two Bash apps working in such a way so that one Bash app sets up my environmental variables and other Bash app actually runs the Bash command, which is like running an executable, for example. So what happens when I try to do such a thing? It's uh, it's like a separate process where the environmental variables get set up. And then when I run my other Bash app for the executable, it does not get transferred. Is there a way I can chain them? For example, like join app, like should join app work here? Oh, that's, I, I can't answer this. Does anyone else want to take a step at it? I have a feeling that we might be getting very much into the weeds of things, but yeah. to give you a generalized answer, if mm -hmm. you want one application to affect the environment in the next one, mm -hmm. that I would say is unsafe behavior. Sure, you oh. can try and hack things to make okay. such a behavior work, but that is unsafe in a distributed context because you Excellent. do have, it's very difficult to make sure that two functions will run together on the same worker on the same node. Excellent. Good, good. Yeah. But yeah. So it's like, I mean, obviously I failed <laughs> and then I had to make my other bash app like really big so that it does everything. I just wanted to compartmentalize it. Okay. Thank you very much. I mean, um, you could, if you, if you pop your question, uh, you know, into the dog, we can maybe you know, mm -hmm. get back at it later. And, but I think if it's, you know, this is like kind of more specific to pass, you can also just pass it in the, you know, in pass support. Yeah, cool. Thank you I mean, very much, sir. Ali Yadur, he is the most ex absolute expert, you know. Yes. Answers available okay, yeah, then. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And Kyle right. just made a good point in the chat that if, your, the first step of your workflow is setting environment variables. Uh, you can do so from the config. Mm. I was just getting ambitious. I mean, that's the straightforward way of doing things. So I thought like, okay, fine, can I do? Yes, that's definitely the straightforward way of doing things. Yeah. Um, so this concludes our tutorial. Tyler, is anything you want to add? Uh, no, I'm just... Thank you all for uh, following along with us. Yeah, thank you all for for um, for listening. And if you if you had trouble with Jupyter notebooks, if you trouble with any of the systems, I I mean I I can help you now in the lunch break if if you want to. Um, so just uh, ping me here on the chat or on the um, on the Slack. Yeah, I would also mention like the Slack might be a good place if you have sort of detailed questions or debugging things um, will be available to help you out on all three facilities. Okay. Uh, well, I think then the next, the next, um, the next tutorial will be fireworks at 11 a.m. Pacific time, which is 30, it's 1 p.m. Central and 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, so we reconvene the time and everyone who wants to like, you know, have the notebooks, uh, you know, just hang on there and contact me. Or, you know, if you have trouble with OCF or SF, you know, talk with Tyler and Christine. Yep, I'll be here.
Um, in the chat, Venita, Venita, which machine are you, uh, or which uh, facility are you running at? Um, I'm on I, uh, Jupiter, nersc.gov. Oh, okay. Bjorn. Yeah, that's me. But uh, I don't use Jupyter Notebooks very often. So the only thing you need to do, did you check out, so you did, you ran the setup parser, right? Yes. Did you, um, did you, uh, clone the git repo. Yes. So then um, let me share, let me share my screen again. Oops. All right, so do you use a training account or you have your own account for this? A uh, training account. Okay, then it looks, then it pretty much looks, uh, With this, um, with the folder, QE HPC workflows, do you have that? Um, no. If you clone the repository, it should be there somewhere. Yes. Um, Because then if you, if you, if it, if it's gone, you just might navigate to um, the the nurse part, and then they should have this the, the notebook here, and it should pick up the right kind of spec um, because it's that's the default that was shipped with the notebook. Um, so where where I mean, do you want to you want to share it? Uh, I mean, then we share it with like everyone else, but. Um, yeah, we can also make think about a breakout room if that's something to to keep back with. Let's see. This is I think this is me not really understanding how this file browser works. Um, oh. So. So I'm in global common. How do I get to the parcel? You navigate back to home. Um, all right, let's, uh, I, I mean, let's do this way. We can, I think it's difficult to kind of, um, to not. Unfortunately, I'm zooming on one computer and I'm on a web browser on a different computer. Oh, oh, I see. I see. Yeah, so I think it's easier to execute everything from inside, from, from home. So if you make CD dollar sign home, you get, you get to your home directory and then you execute okay. all the commands from, from there. So then to the DOE folder. Oh yeah, you have you see the folder? Yes. Yes, if you navigate on the left, um, um, I, I've also made support rooms if you guys want to join a um, breakout room. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you. So, Vinita, do you want to join the nurse support room and we continue there? Okay, so where it says join a breakout room? Uh, yeah, in the breakout rooms in the very bottom, they're free to choose from. A nurse support, ASF support, um, OCF support. So Which just, one? Uh, there's one called nurse support. Just if okay. You can navigate over there and I come afterwards. Okay, I see you. 